Well, welcome everybody to another episode of Common Sense. I'm Dr. Ben Carson, your host. So glad to have you here today. We're going to talk about something very, very important and something that really does uh, apply to common sense. Common sense makes what we're going to talk about much, much easier. You know, inflation is really the worst tax of all because it really hits the poor people much harder than it does people who have plenty of money. If you have, if you're making a million dollars a year, and inflation is raging, uh, you know it really doesn't bother you that much. But if you're making seventy-five thousand dollars a year, or thirty thousand dollars a year, it's a killer. And you know there seem to be a lot of people in Washington D.C. these days who don't really seem to understand that. You know, a lot of people like our president, the head of the Senate, Speaker of the House, you know, they've been in politics their whole adult life. They don't know anything about making a budget. They have no idea how you treat other people and what kind of struggles they go through, or at least they don't act like they have an idea of it. And it's a real problem, and it happens across political spectrum, both Democrats and Republicans. But it is so good to have people who have real-life experience. And uh, we have such an individual today. But small business is the backbone of our economy. More than 50% of people who have jobs have them through small business. And, you know... When money gets tight, Americans know that you have to tighten the belt. People who work day to day, they understand that. People who don't, don't seem to know that. Well, I want to welcome John Snyder. You know him as Papa John. He is the John of Papa John's Pizza. Built a pizza empire out of a broom closet in his father's tavern. Even sold his car to help his father's business and wanted to start a business of his own. Such an important part of the American dream. Well, that dream eventually became a restaurant, a restaurant company with more than 5,000 stores in 45 countries around the world. John, welcome to the show. Oh, what an honor, Ben. Thanks for having me. And... You know, you have a great story about achieving the American dream. Can you give us a thumbnail? How <laughs> in the world did you get started and go to such heights in a relatively short period of time? Well, um, we had, first of all, we had a great team. We just had a really great group of folks. Not only did we have everybody on the right bus, we had everybody in the right seat doing what they were really good at. Uh, but we had two fundamental principles early on. Take care of your people and take care of your product and uh, run a business on principles and natural law, uh, honesty, integrity, win-win relationships, collaborative alliance, uh, kindness, thoughtfulness, mutual respect, and you'll do just fine. And I uh, was uh, blessed to have a father and a grandfather that that really instilled that in me at an early age. I was cutting grass when I was eight, painting gutters when I was 10, washing dishes mm -hmm. when I was 14. And so I had that entrepreneur spirit, not only is it in all the genes on several uh, sides of the all the, the, the gene uh, pool, but <clears throat> I was raised as an entrepreneur. So, uh, you know, you were talking about the hardship, and we'll get into that a little bit more of the present day uh, entrepreneur and small business. And Ben, I don't think you can really understand or appreciate or have empathy for somebody unless you've really walked a mile in their shoe. And not only did we start in a bankrupt bar in Daddy's Tavern selling 50 cent beers, we started Papa John's in a broom closet with $1,600. Then we built one small business, one store, then two. And then at store 5,000, our average franchisee had probably four stores, three stores, five stores. So we were a family of small businesses. So we probably know as much about uh, the ins and outs and the institutional knowledge of small business and what they're up against than, than, than anybody. And, you know, small businesses 
provide so many opportunities for the community. A lot of people get their start in organizations like yours. And, uh, you know, they use that as a springboard to go on to do other things. But they learn those principles while they're there, too, uh, watching the way that the business is run. Uh, ha having said that, you know, just this week it was announced that California is going to be requiring a minimum wage in certain small, relatively small businesses of $22 an hour. What what would that what would that do to a place like Papa John's? Remember, Ben, I started in '84, which was Reaganomics. We had a leader that was pro business, uh, low regulation, low taxes, uh, small government. Remember the ten most disastrous words? I'm from the government, and I'm here to help. <laughs> Uh, that spirit, that um, that leader, that flame that wanted guys and, and girls like me to succeed, uh, I had that. And now you got a situation where you've got a governor of California that yesterday said by 2035, we're going to move to all electric cars. The day after says you got to unplug your car. The day after. So um, lunatic, crazy. Um, I want to be nice here. But you're dealing with people that have never uh, run a small business, never had to make payroll, uh, never had to really understand what it's how hard it is. Nine out of ten small businesses fail. And in a small business, you need three things. And remember, all big businesses are small businesses. Ford Motor Company was one guy. You know, General Motors was, you know, one guy, Chevrolet. So <clears throat> a, a big business is always a small business. You have to have a passion for what you do. You could be selling ice cream. You could be a surgeon. Um, you could be a great neurosurgeon. You could be an architect. You could be a pizza maker. You could fry. It doesn't matter. You really got to have a passion for that. You got to be best in your class. You want to be a leader. You know, you want to be the very best. And you have to have a unit, econo unit economic model that produces a profit. If you don't make a profit, you not only can't survive, you can't reinvest, you can't give back to your communities, you can't give employees. And so <clears throat> $22 an hour is double what Papa John's can afford to protect circle number three, unit economics. Uh, right. It's a disaster. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting, but people who rail against that uh, or who make a statement like you just made uh, would be considered... Uh, an enemy of the state these days. Yeah. You know, the, the president recently called those who support his opposition mega Republicans. And he said that they are a danger to the freedoms of this country. Well, what do you think he's trying to do? We're certainly not trying to bring the country together. Um, you can call it socialism. You can call it fascism. You can call it... Uh, destroy the uh, the countryism. Uh, if I was on Ben Carson's show, I'd call it anti common sense. What I call it, um, mm -hmm. I man, that is a tough question, and I'll just shoot you straight as I can shoot you. He's either intentionally trying to start destroy America, destroy our middle class, which is the backbone of the country, or he's just stupid, just plain stupid. Because how many blue states, blue cities? Do you got to tear up and destroy with homelessness, um, inflation, to your point, uh, defund the police, um, you know, destruction, standard of living going negative. I mean, every single case is a blue state, a blue city, and yet they keep doing it. I mean, you can't. there's no way humanly possible that they're that stupid. So right. that begs the question, and now, we, now we're now we getting into, okay, who's really pulling the purse strings here? Is it Soros? Is it Gates? Is it the Rothschilds? I don't know, but it ain't Joe Biden. I mean, I think he's the puppet. I think he, but I, who's the puppet master? And this, you know, my feeling is if you want uh, um, to have a global economy, uh, you have to bring America along with you. The only way to get America to come along is make things so bad here that people don't have a choice but to elect to be a global um, part of a global economy with a global currency with global 
you know, four right. or five people running it because uh, they'll vote on it because maybe they think that's you know, the last resort. But I think they're intentionally trying to st- destroy America. I just think they're too intelligent not to know exactly what they're doing. Now, that's out there a little bit. But you say it's a conspiracy, conspiracy theory. No, it's right in front of our eyes. They're doing it right in front of us. Uh, you started off the show with inflation. When you mm-hmm. deficit spend, you devalue the dollar. You devalue the dollar, you got to print money. You print money, you have a cruel, hidden future tax on all America workers. Yeah, well, historically, when fascists move in and Marxists move in, all you have to do is go back and study history. What do they always do? They characterize those who oppose them as evil, as people who are in the way of progress, as people who have very evil intentions. And then it's not so bad if bad things happen to them. For instance, if you hire 87,000 IRS agents and sick them on those people, well, they deserve that anyway because they're trying to destroy our country. Yeah, they, they always do that. And some of them obviously take it much further than that. You, you look at, uh, you know, Stalin and people who just killed millions of people in Mao. Um, I, I hope it doesn't come to that in this country. But it is a pattern first. You demonize your opposition and you make it seem like they're such bad people and that they're against the interest of the country and the people. And therefore, whatever you do to them is okay. It's the same philosophy that jihadists use. You know, you're infidels and it's okay to lie to you to cheat you, uh, to even kill you, to behead you, because it is the best thing for the society. So we need to be very, very careful uh, where we are right now. And uh, we, we really, I think, need to be thinking about how do we actually bring our country together? Because it's such a powerful country. It can't be brought down by Russia or China or, or Iran or North Korea, but it can be brought down from inside. A house divided against itself cannot stand. And I think that's what we're facing right now. We have to be smart enough not to allow ourselves to be pushed into a corner and arm up with our battle gear and be ready to start a civil war. Because that's that's where it would lead. Somebody has to be the adult in the room. Well, to your point, this all started back in 1918 with the Frankfurt Institute, Frankfurt College, mm-hmm. and their whole model with Marxism and fascism has been disrupt, disrupt, disrupt with no answer, just get disrupting. Mm-hmm. And they did it with uh, attacking the middle class and then the sexual revolution in the 60s and 70s um, and the culture attacks the last 20 years. Now they're attacking our kids. If you mm-hmm. just really watch these folks, um, whether it's pedophilia uh, drugs, uh, things on the internet, um, CRT, um, locking parents up or harassing parents because they don't like what's being taught. They're really chasing our kids and our kids are our future. Our youth is our future. But people ask me, what's the light at the end of the tunnel? I say, it's, it's a 330 million souls in this country that need to wake up to your point. We were raised by the greatest generation. You were raised, look, you know, by the way, I never thought I'd get to speak with you, much less interview with you. But, I mean, you were raised by a single mother that taught you right from wrong and simple principles and hard work. Um, and to, little, to digress really quickly, you, you said something 10 years ago that it sticks with me just about every day. You said, when I operate on somebody, once I open that skull, I have no idea what the color of their skin is. And mm-hmm. we're all human beings. We're all in this together. We, we really are. And so we know from the greatest generation, parents and grandparents, what's fair, what's unfair, what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's evil. And if you're in the Midwest and you're watching what happens in the Northeast or out West, you're watching all the good in Florida and Texas and Utah, surely to goodness we can say, we do not want our electricity turned off. We don't want our kids to learn about things that are nefarious at that age. 
we we don't want um, crime rampant and devaluation of the dollar and the entrepreneur spirit uh, uh, canceled. And we don't want to be mandated on what we put in our bodies. Surely to God, the, the rest of the country now can look at the consequences of fascism, Marxism, i.e. Detroit, Seattle, uh, Minneapolis, L.A., New York, and say, that's not our future we want for our kids and our grandkids. Um, unfortunately, conservatives, or fortunately, they wake up, they work, they take care of their families. They don't like to get involved with politics. They don't like doing what we're doing right here, and I don't like it either. But if we're going to save this country, not only we got to vote, we got to be heard. We cannot continue to let our country lose the moral and ethical fabric. I mean, for God's sake, the framers prayed more than they were in writing the Constitution. There's a church right across the street. They prayed. Everything is uh, um, unalienable rights and yes. principles and values in a creator. And God we trust on every bill. And we have to get back to that moral fabric if we're going to save this country. Yeah, you're so right. And, you know, it was uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, while they were coming down the home stretch on the Constitution, and they couldn't agree. And he said, gentlemen, stop. Let's get down on our knees and seek wisdom from God. Mm -hmm. And they all prayed, and they resolved their issue. Mm -hmm. But also, things that I remember so much about uh, that story is when they were finished with the Constitution, and Franklin walked out of the Constitution Hall, a woman asked them, Sir, what do we have here, a monarchy or a republic? And he said, a republic, if we can keep it. Yeah. And that's a big if. We've managed to keep it for 250 years, but our founders understood that the natural tendency of government is to grow and to control. And that's why they worked so hard to give us a constitution that would allow us to remain free, that would allow us to remain a people-centric nation rather than a government-centric nation. But it's going to be a struggle, and anybody who thinks that we can keep it without fighting for it is delusional. Yeah, Jefferson, on top of that, said we're always one generation away from losing our freedoms. And let's take Trump. He lost his freedom of speech. They shut him off. Now they raid his home. They've tied him up, and that's what the left does as lawyers and PR. They they persecute him in the press unfairly, and then they they uh, there's no judicial justice and, and um, you know innocent before proven guilty. They raid the man's home, and when we were Papa John's, we said the Pledge of Allegiance before every town hall meeting. We ran our company on principles. We debunked the left's ideology on every single corner. So like yourself, uh, the amount of personal tax you get, as you well know, is something that in America you and I never thought we'd have to deal with. And the message there is if it happens to Donald Trump and the parents over in West Virginia uh, and Ben Carson and Papa John, uh, and now the IRS has got 87,000 agents armed for bear, it can happen to every single American that doesn't go along with their ideology. And that's where they're trying to take this. And we're going to just have to fight like hell to make sure that doesn't happen. That's exactly right. Every American is going to have to take this very seriously at this point. And when you go to vote, which is such an important right, when you go to vote, you need to know what you're voting for. Most people go in and they just look for the name that looks familiar. That's not the way to vote. No. You have to actually know what these people stand for and what are their values congruent with yours. And uh, most objective studies show that the vast majority of Americans actually don't agree with this far leftist tilt. Uh, but most people are afraid to say anything. The majority of people stand in the corner with their head down and hope someone doesn't call them a nasty name. You can't do that. You can't have the land of the free if you're not the home of the brave. And we will be back after a minute. Please stay with us. And we're back again with John Snodder. You know him as the creator of Papa John's Pizza. But we know him as a great American, a patriot, who has worked very hard, provide 
a lot of jobs and a lot of opportunities for a lot of people and has a very good sense of how our system works. And uh, we're very interested in, in his take on a lot of subjects uh, that affect all of us. But one of the things that uh, has been very much uh, in the forefront lately is green energy and the push for green energy and how we try to subject everything uh, to the green energy philosophy. Uh, what's your thinking about green energy and this push? Well, I'm pro environment. I'm an outdoor doorist. I mean, I like, I love the outdoors. I love nature. I love the hand of God. Um, and so the strides we've made the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years on uh, protecting our environment uh, have been fantastic. Are we there yet? No. Will we ever get there? No. But you're not going to uh, jump from A to Z. Um, right. it, it, the grand victory is won by baby wins on the way up. So step by step, I'll give you an example. Last 48 hours, California, you know, we're going to be all electric cars by 2035. The very next day, as our talk earlier, they can't put electricity in cars because they're out of electricity. So it, it simply is not feasible uh, and not reasonable to do that. Um, where that stops with me with a hard uh, no, a red line is when you're using the environment as an, as an excuse to control other people. Um, you know, the vaccine, um, the lockdowns, <clears throat> the you take the shot or you're fired. Um, when it's used to control people and manipulate uh, and, and as a kind of a, you know, taking the, the herd off the, the cliff, um, that's where I have to draw a line and say that's, that's not right. But mm -hmm. when America's walking the talk on what it's supposed to be doing for clean energy and clean air and is subsidizing all these uh, committees and boards throughout the world uh, to do the same, and then you have a China that's an habitual offender on uh, their production and emissions of pollution. Uh, I would be more tougher on some of these other countries as we baby step our way uh, to uh, less emissions from from our cars and from our factories and and from our absolutely. Uh, and uh, you know, interestingly enough, you know, we have been blessed in this country with an enormous amount. Of energy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have a lot of natural resources. We've got enough natural gas to last us for more than 100 years and to supply Europe at the same time. And we've learned how to extract it in a very clean way. Yes. And uh, logic and common sense would say use what you have to get what you want. Don't destroy what you have and create a bigger chasm that you have to go across in order to get what you want. Right. And uh, why is it that uh, that people can't understand that? I, I, I don't know. It's almost as if, you know, they're infected with some kind of zombie virus or something. They just can't seem to see common sense and how you get to what you're trying to do. Well, as we talked about a second ago, the light at the end of the tunnel is our souls and uh, us as human beings. And as Einstein said, the level of consciousness that solved yesterday's problems will not solve tomorrow's issues. Um, when we talked about the, the, the 330 points of light, our souls, we're talking about new, um, quantum physics, a level of, of compassion, joy, love, enlightenment, kindness, thoughtfulness, um, consideration for our fellow man that's going to have to be the mindset uh, out of a, a very caring position that's going to solve today's problems. Okay, that's one issue. That's we're up here in the quantum field. Mm -hmm. This uh, issue was is basically cause and effect. If I'm on a non-political show, I don't get political. I just say cause and effect, which is linear Newtonian physics. If you the first day in office <clears throat> cut off four percent of your supply, the Keystone Pipeline, you come out of the pandemic and demand goes up. Uh, the price of fuel is going to. And I did this interview February of 2020. I said, you know, hey. This is going to go over three, probably four. If we have in a one-off, i.e., the Ukrainian situation, you're going to be at five dollars a barrel. People looked at or five dollars a gallon. People looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> Furthermore, if you 
open up the Nordstrom pipeline and you give Putin $700 billion and you put up a weak front or a weak showing in Afghanistan, Putin's going to attack Ukraine. This is simple common sense Newtonian sure. physics. And Absolutely. so, you know, to think you're going to cut off uh, the supply and then make it harder to drill and really threaten uh, oil production at every stage of the way and not hurt the price a gallon defies logic. I don't know if you call that right. lunatic, uh, buffoonian, um, illogical, but it's certainly hurtful to the folks that wake up every day and make this country great, which is what we started this interview off. They're the heartbeat. They're the backbone of the whole country. And, you know, it's all a domino effect because if you hand Putin the energy keys, so you see what happened uh, over there, and then that encourages China and uh, all the other dictators around the world are starting to say, you know, we've been sort of behaving ourselves because the United States doesn't like that kind of behavior. But, you know, they're not particularly influential right now uh, because anybody who knows world history remembers what the world was like before the United States became a great power. Yeah. All these despots went around crushing anybody who was near them. Yes. Uh, that was weaker than they were. Yep. And, uh, you know, we, to a large degree, put an end to that kind of a world. It, it will reemerge. And if, and if we go down and, uh, you know, China, for instance, becomes the dominant power in the world, believe me, uh, things are going to change dramatically. And people need to understand that. And, it, and they have something to do with it. The American people have a lot to do with what happens to the world. But they have to be serious about voting. And this is not about Democrats or Republicans. This is about people who love our Constitution, understand that we are a beacon of freedom for the entire world, and people who want to change to something else which empowers them. Amen. Yeah, if you see evil and do nothing about evil, you're evil. And to stand up against this takes courage on your part, my part, and all of Americans. But if we want the best for our kids and grandkids, we got to get off this crazy uh, path we're on and get back to the basics, get back mm -hmm. to the framers' vision and principles and um, alienary rights of the American people to make this country what it needs to be. Well, before we take another break, I want to ask you about something that's causing a lot of angst right now. And that is the forgiveness of student loans. Uh, what is your thinking on that topic? Um, I think it sets a terrible example for a person's personal integrity. You know, you can't have mutual respect if you don't have self-respect. And you can't have self-respect if you don't have uh, personal integrity. What concerns me most about the COVID uh, lockdowns and all the entitlements that went out. The GDP as a percent of government uh, versus total GDP went from 15% to 30%. It doubled. So that's kind of, we got a little taste of what socialism looks like. And, you know, habits are formed in 22 days, solidified in about two and a half months, and they get a lifestyle change in about four months. And we went two years where people got to sit at home, trapped in their houses, not do anything, and make money. But mm -hmm. as a human being, when you make a commitment to show up for a job and you don't show up and you're not on time, yeah, you hurt the business owner. Yeah, you hurt the manager. More importantly, you hurt all your fellow team members because you didn't show up. They got to do more work. But what you did, you violated your personal integrity. You lied. You said you'd show up. You said you'd show up on time and you were dishonest and you didn't show up. That lack of self respect. Now, one step further, you borrow the money and you don't pay it back. Third, you borrow the money, you don't pay it back. And a person that didn't have the opportunity to go to college, a plumber, electrician, um, you know, a carpenter, now they have to pay for your education. So this is a lose, lose, lose all the way around. Um, and it's just a way to buy votes. Um, it's wrong for the people that pay back their loans. 
It's wrong for the people that are paying back their loans. And it just sets a terrible example for future um, mindset that when I'm not responsible, uh, the government's going to help me. And that's the last thing you want to do is be dependent on the government. The ultimate slavery is being a, a slave to the government. You know, when they got, yeah, when they've got you, they got you and you're stuck for life. And that was supposed to be the thing that was so unique about this country. It was country of, for, and by the people, with the government playing a relatively limited role and uh, entrepreneurship and innovation being the drivers of our society. And that's why I think we went from a ragtag bunch of militiamen to the pinnacle of the world in record time. But as the government has become bigger and bigger and more and more invasive, uh, that uniqueness is disappearing. Yeah. And we're becoming very much like everybody else. And I don't think most Americans actually want that to happen, but they feel relatively helpless. Yeah. And they feel they can't do anything and they feel they don't have a voice. And that's one of the reasons that we have to keep speaking out. We have to keep encouraging people. And, uh, you know, we can turn this around and we can make this country great, even though there are some who say make this country great is a racist remark. And it's not a racist remark. It creates an oasis, a place where people love to come. And if we were this systemically horrible racist place, why would people be forming caravans trying to get in here? And when they got here, wouldn't they call all their friends and relatives and say, don't come here, this is a horrible place. <laughs> uh, just the opposite is yeah. going on. And that tells you something very important, and that is we live in a society now where the powers that be want to convince you not to pay attention to what you see or what you hear or what your heart tells you. Just listen to them. They'll tell you what's right. They'll tell you what's true. And uh, as people begin to accept that, they will be indeed giving up a lot of freedom. So uh, I think we have to keep making sure that people understand what's going on. And we will be back in another moment with our tremendous guest, John Schnatter. And we're back again with John Schneider. You know him as the creator and founder of Papa John's Pizza. And I'm sure we've all enjoyed that over the years. But more importantly, someone who has a business mind and who loves America, who loves patriots. And I want to ask you, John, uh, prior to this administration, the philosophy was that a, a rising tide lifts all boats. And uh, there was a big emphasis on decreasing taxes, let people have more of their own money, and decreasing regulations so that you don't stand in the way of entrepreneurship and innovation. And, and now we've gone 180 degrees in the other direction. Do you think that has something to do with the great economic boom we saw before and the economic bust that we're seeing now? Or is that just a coincidence? Well, I think everything starts with a mindset. Um, <clears throat> you know, attitude uh, is everything. If you think you can, you're right. And if you think you can't, you're right that way too. So when you have a minimalist uh, concept of the universe, whereas if I don't get my slice of pie, somebody's going to get theirs, versus a capitalist or free market mindset that, no, just make the pie bigger and we'll all get a bigger share, uh, you end up with a selfish, um, uh, very small um, mindset and way to look at things, um, a minimalist approach, which is not America. America got great by getting bigger, bigger with its GDP. And, you know, as, as you, uh, you know, spread the wealth, we all kind of come up together. When you start Papa John's, you start out with 1600 bucks, and you're paying yourself $50 a week in salary. When I left the company, we were paying the top 10 people over a million dollars a year. You can't do that in a broom closet. So the, the way to work your way out of this is let the entrepreneur spirit flow, um, have innovation, grow that GDP, grow that productivity, 
uh, grow that entrepreneur spirit and the pie gets bigger and we all get a better share of it. Absolutely. Now that's real common sense for you. Well, what's your outlook as we go forward? What do you think can get us as a nation back on track? Well, I've always been a huge Trump fan, um, especially with his policies, his work ethic, his love for the country, and his results. I don't know if any president got as much done as quickly as he did. Um, I used to give him a little bit of hard way to go because I would go about things a little bit differently. You work with him, um, so you would know better than I. Um, Ben, I got to tell you, I'm not sure you can be any different than he is and not stand up to what he has to stand up against. This, when, he, when you say drain the swamp, you're dealing with a level of deceit, ma- manipulation, evil, hatred, the likes of you, something that you and I and the average men and women in this country, they simply don't understand. And it's going to take somebody that is going to stick to their guns and hold them accountable. Uh, but I think you've got to get... Uh, a Trump, a DeSantis, a Candace Owens, somebody like yourself, you got to get a leader in place that's going to be tough and say there's uh, enough of an, as enough. Um, we start with the midterms coming up. My gosh, we have so much common sense. I call it cause and effect. You call it common sense, but I, I like the common sense. We have so much common sense right in front of us, cause and effect, that we're going down the wrong way on the the base the at a basic uh Newtonian level. So if this this November is critical for this country mm-hmm. to stop a lot of this nonsense. <clears throat> and I believe in the American people. I believe in the heart and soul of this country. I think at the end of the day uh it's a great country with great people, with great souls that want to do the right thing. And then I think we head on to twenty twenty four and we, we get back on track. I mean, Reagan got us back on track. Uh, Trump got us back on Trump on track. Let's, let's see something in 2024. You know, the Democratic Party has nobody that's really a great leader. Um, like yourself and Trump and DeSantis and Herschel Walker, um, Candace. I mean, we have a, a young lady from South Dakota. Um, we just have so many great, uh, Republican conservative leaders that I think that we're going to be in good shape. And I, I think America's had enough of this nonsense. And the bad news is that they went out and printed $15 trillion. The good news is that people will get to see in real time what that does to the value of the dollar. Usually they do it over such a slow period of time, such a long period of time, that we don't feel the effect. This right. happens so quickly that you watch, you know, 7, 8, 9, 10% inflation numbers and you destroy your buying power. And I think America is woken up to that. I mean, the country, the declaration, life, you know, don't shoot each other. Don't raid the man's home in Mar-a-Lago. Liberty, let me go about the day with the government not being on my back in the pursuit of happiness. And the pursuit of happiness is freedom. The freedom go out and start a business. The freedom... Uh, to love your neighbor and love your community and to put in a good day's work. I mean, there's nothing that's more gratifying and more joyous than to know that you did a really good job on something that was incredibly difficult. You look at when you were working on brains. Think about when you did, when you separated those Siamese twins. I mean, when you overcome a difficult task and you do it in a very competent, competent way, there's joy. And that's what you feel mm-hmm. when you put in a good day's work and you make a contribution to yourself and to your fellow man. Absolutely. And I totally agree with you in terms of the American people. When I was running for president and traveling to all the little nooks and crannies, it doesn't matter which part of the country you were in. People had common sense. Not so much in Washington, D.C., but, you know, throughout the rest of the country, it really is quite amazing. And I think what we have to do is get people to realize how much power they actually have. Yeah and uh, to make sure that they exercise it appropriately. Our founders created a system because they understood that the, what the natural tendency of government was. They knew we would get to this point, but they provided us a mechanism to salvage the situation, but we got to make sure that we take advantage of it. Amen. John, I want to thank you so much for your wisdom, for your insights, for your courage. 
uh, for what you've done to make America a better place. Thank you for being with us today. Thanks for being. It's, it's been a real, uh, it's been a real honor. Thank you so much. All right. And we'll be back with our closing thoughts and our prescription for you and a question from one of our listeners. Well, thanks to John Schneider for being here with us today, taking time out to join us with uh, his take on what's going on in our country and a manifestation of some common sense. Uh, we've had uh, many of you write in with questions, and uh, I have one here from Rod from Crozet, Virginia. He asked, I just listened to your common sense episode on abortion. It was well done. It addressed many of the issues of aborting a fetus that has taken on the form of a human being. Your episode indicated that life begins at conception. However, it does not seem credible that there is a real problem with aborting a fertilized egg that now consists of two cells or later becomes four cells or eight or 16. What scientific argument, not theological, do you have that aborting a 16 cell fetus is somehow wrong? On what basis would you advocate for laws that prohibit aborting that fetus or taking the choice away from the pregnant woman? Clearly the issue eventually gets more problematic later on and people can argue at what point it is wrong to abort the fetus. One can argue that at some point the fetus has rights, but I can't see that that is true when it has eight or 32 or 64 cells. Your thoughts, please. Well, I can understand uh, Rod's uh, feelings on that. Uh, a lot of people say it's not really him being until it looks like a human being. But interestingly enough, is a liver cell a human being? Is a gastrointestinal lining cell a human being? Is a heart cell a human being? Uh, no. And they're never going to be a human being. Is a gamut a human being? That is, a cell that has 23 chromosomes that you find in the female eggs or a cell in human sperm that has 23 chromosomes. If you leave that alone, will it develop into a human being? Absolutely not. But when the sperm gamete with its 23 chromosomes meets up with the egg gamete with its 23 chromosomes, you have a complete set of 46 chromosomes, an individual, not the mother, not the father, a unique individual with all the genetic information to go on and to become an independent human being. That's the difference between a zygote which is what happens when the two gametes meet together and then rapidly starts to divide, rapidly starts to develop. I mean, within six to eight weeks of that conception, you can recognize arms and legs and facial features, a heart that starts to beat. And soon after that, independent movement and reaction to the environment. I mean, th people can argue, and they probably always will argue. They say, well, I just don't feel that that's a human being. But here's what's important about the system of government that we have. It was designed so that those kinds of issues could be settled by the people and the representatives of the people not by a bunch of unelected judicial officials. That is extremely important. So thank you, Rod, for that question. And I'd love to hear your 
uh, questions, make sure you send us an email, indicate that it's from the podcast, indicate that somewhere in your uh, line of questioning. And uh, we will try to answer those questions from time to time. Now, in terms of our assignment for this week, we're now fully back to a school from kindergarten to college. And it's a time of great excitement, but also some anxiety. In your assignment this week, find that person in your sphere of influence who's going back to school and see if you can come up with some words that will alleviate their anxiety and encourage them. Encourage them to take advantage of the wonderful resources that will be available for them in the educational environment. And please subscribe for free to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you get your broadcast. Make sure that you never miss an episode. And remember to rate and review us. Always remember the important treasures that we have our cornerstone principles, faith, liberty, community, and life. Until next week, see you then.